Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for coming. Uh, again, my name is Derek Bennett. I'm, the, uh, I'm on the data platform team at Stitch Fix, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we scaled our data science capabilities using Apache Spark. So I'm going to start off and just talk a little bit about Stitch Fix and what we are and what we do, and then talk a little bit about um, also our team. And then uh, I'll talk about how we use Spark and mostly what our use cases are and what parts of Spark we actually are leveraging today and thinking about doing. And then most of my presentation is going to be on the, the details of our Spark architecture and how we connect everything together. And then I'll finish off with some challenges, challenges that we faced and some ongoing projects that we have. So first of all, just about Stitch Fix. Uh, we're a personalized online retail company based here in San Francisco. Uh, we also have five warehouses throughout the country and a customer service center in Austin. And the majority of our employees are actually remote stylists that pick out uh, clothing for customers um, and, and send that to them in shipments, uh, which we call fixes. And so the stylists choose the fixes based on recommendations that our algorithms come up with about what's the best match for the person based on a style profile that they fill out when they sign up. Then when the customer gets their shipment, they decide what they want. Um, they pay for what they keep and send the rest back and send us additional feedback on their shipment, which helps us inform the, the recommendations for the next shipment. And so it's really all about like matching up people with what's best for them. And so we have a slogan that encapsul encapsulates all that uh, called uh, empowering people to find what they love. So a little bit about our team. Uh, I'm on the algorithms team at Stitch Fix. Uh, in total, we have about 80 people dedicated to data science and analytics. And so we're broken up into a few different teams. Uh, the majority of people are in three uh, vertically focused data science teams. So for example, we have one uh, team that's um, specifically focused on styling and the styling algorithms and things in that area. I'm actually on the data platform team, and our job is to support the business and support the other teams with infrastructure and tools and services to help them do everything that they're doing. Now, one thing that's different about us is we don't have a, uh, an ETL writing team or a Spark writing team or even really like anything that would correspond to a data team. Uh, data scientists actually own their own pipelines from start to finish. Um, so we don't write their Spark jobs for them. Uh, we obviously provide a lot of support and a lot of help, but uh, our charter is really to be as self-service as, as much as we possibly can. Right, and um, my manager wrote a blog um, a, a few years ago called Engineers Shouldn't Write ETL, and I think that kind of encapsulate, encapsulates our philosophy pretty well. Uh, we want to be enablers and provide self-service and infrastructure and not um, write people's jobs for them. So a little bit about how we use Spark and how we leverage Spark. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, we're pretty heavy users of Spark SQL, um, but we actually don't just use Spark SQL. We also use uh, the data frames and the data frames API pretty heavily, and we have a lot of jobs that are uh, a mix of both. Uh, we're pretty heavy users of uh, the Hive Metastore, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our architecture in more detail and how we actually take advantage of that. So specifically when we use um, the uh, SQL API, we're actually using the, the Hive context. Uh, we're mostly using PySpark. Uh, we do have a few, few people that are writing Scala jobs, and we also have written our own Scala libraries that we uh, use to accompany Spark jobs. And we have a few people that are starting to use some capabilities of Spark ML. So a little bit about what's different about us. Um, so the vast majority of our data is in um, structured hive tables um, that reside in S3. And uh, you know, in the big data world, we're actually like probably on the smaller side compared to a lot of the other talks that you're hearing about today. Um, so instead of having a few large jobs that run on you know, petabytes of data, we have you know, thousands of jobs that run every day. And some of them are pretty big, but um, quite a lot of them are, are, are very small you know, and finish in like 10 or 15 minutes or something like that. So for us, scalability is a lot about um, multi-tenancy and um, enabling new capabilities and things like that, rather than sheer data size. And because we had, we've only been using Spark for about uh, two years now overall, and um, because Spark has a SQL interface, it was a very easy way for um, data, science, data scientists to transition in and start using it. And of course, now we're starting to go beyond just using it that way. So I'm just, I won't have time to go through these in detail, but I wanted to point out a few interesting use cases that kind of go beyond simple um, queries or, or ETL jobs. 
Um, so we have several people that are doing um, various things, analyzing website traffic and analyzing visitors and trying to tie those to actual customers, figure out um, how we can convert customers better, um, if people are having trouble filling out their style profile and things like that. And one of the jobs that I helped somebody with, they had something that wasn't in Spark before and they had a lot of Python code written around that and we were able to structure the job in such a way that they were able to leverage a lot of their existing Python code and still use Spark to run the query and solve the problem. You know, we took advantage of some broadcast variables to uh, send a table of rules out to the uh, executors so that they could use the existing logic that they already had. Uh, we have um, what we call a client states engine, which is essentially looking at um, client history, whether they have a shipment in progress or not, whether they've got their shipment and they're in the process of maybe doing some exchanges and things like that. Um, it's a chain of multiple queries combined with the use of the Spark APIs, and these results uh, kind of help us do a lot of other things, including planning demand and figuring out what the uh, you know, lifetime value of a customer is gonna be. Uh, we also have people looking at different segments. So you know, in retail, we have different segments. We have, uh, we started off with just women, now we have men. Um, we kind of started with um, you know, kind of mid-range sizes, but now we have petites and plus sizes. So we have a lot of jobs that look at these different client segments and kind of run different Spark jobs that are very similar to each other uh, in a kind of a loop. And we have an API that makes it easy them, for them to do that. And we also have someone who's uh, started using um, you know, Spark ML. Um, mainly what he's been doing is using Spark's, uh, a variation of Spark's logistic re regression model to do uh, feature selection um, over uh, millions of sparse features. So we're kind of just getting started on that effort. So now I'd like to cover a little bit more about uh, our Spark architecture uh, in a little more detail. So first, this picture just kind of gives an overview of um, where most of our data lives and how Spark fits into the, the ecosystem. So uh, we're pretty much all uh, Amazon AWS based. Um, so all of our services, including like um, our, our engineering apps and our uh, customer facing apps uh, run on Amazon AWS now. And so we also run Spark and EMR the same way. So our data warehouse is actually uh, resides in S3 and we use uh, the Hive Metastore uh, to uh, map the schemas and the tables and the partitions that we have and all the data locations that we have in S3 for all of those. And you can see on here, uh, we have Spark, which um, directly uses the data from S3 and uh, for the most part writes back to S3 when it um, writes back the results of the jobs. Uh, we also have, like as other query engines, we also make use of uh, Presto, which is uh, an open source tool that um, was started by Facebook. Um, and Teradata has also done a lot of work on that uh, recently as well. Uh, we also are pretty heavy users of Amazon Redshift, and we do a lot of syncing back and forth between uh, Redshift and S3. Uh, and our data scientists are using um, mostly uh, you know, R and Python, and we have clients that allow them to talk to um, all three of these things, um, Spark, Presto, and, S3, and uh, uh, Redshift. And of course, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, our Spark setup as we go along. So just some notes to kind of add to uh, what I just showed you in the picture. Um, so we use Amazon S3 uh, as our data store. Um, it allows us to easily do uh, read, writes, and deletes. Um, there's no really uh, appends or updates, um, but of course in our situation that's not um, so much of an issue. We initially ingest our data from our engineering databases that power all of our customer facing apps and the apps that run the warehouse and things like this. Uh, we also ingest things through our uh, log pipeline which we're uh, actually upgrading to use uh, Kafka at the moment. And uh, as I've said before, um, we're pretty um, heavy users of Hive also, but not on the execution side, mainly just the Metastore side. And this is really mainly to keep track of the schemas and partitions for all the tables that we have uh, on S3. And the uh, tables and partitions always point to the uh, location of the most recent data for each table uh, in S3. So Spark primarily works with S3. Uh, we, don't, um, we do bring in some other data sources for some jobs, but that's where most of its data comes from. And uh, as I mentioned, we have the other query engines for doing uh, more interactive uh, SQL-based queries. So uh, adding a little bit uh, of co additional color to what I've been talking about. So um, you know, we do have other things like uh, you know, Postgres databases and Redshift and things like that, but um, the S3 warehouse is our, our master data. So even though we're syncing things back and forth to Redshift, S3 is always the, the source of truth for everything that we're doing. 
and of course the Hive Metastore is the source of truth for the, the schemas that go along with that. And when we want to uh, add new data or override a table, uh, we take a, a lot of advantage of um, partition tables in Hive, and so we're writing, um, for example, a new partition every day, or like for some of the event data every hour, things like that. Um, but we also use something called uh, the batch ID pattern, which what this really is is it's just a, a hidden inner directory that's based on a timestamp. And when we want to override a table or a partition, uh, we write to that new data location with that um, batch ID inside of it. And then once it's done, we update the Hive Metastore to point to that new location. And the advantage of this is that it, it well, there's a couple advantages, but it allows us to easily you know, come up with new versions of a table um, if something needs to be run or something like that. And it also allows us to easily roll back if something goes wrong. So the Hive Metastore is really where we manage all of the uh, schema uh, and uh, data locations and everything associated with tables. And we're actually working on kind of a, um, an upgraded version of the Metastore that allows us to add some of our own metadata to um, not only at the table level, but also at the field level. Just a lot of it is for documentation, but also kind of data lineage, like where did this table come from and how was it, where was it actually derived from and things like that. <clears throat> And so uh, we don't keep any data uh, permanently in HDFS. I mean, obviously we do some things um, transitively during jobs. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with temporary tables and things like that. Uh, but again, the permanent data store is, is always S3. So now I'd like to talk a little bit more in depth about uh, our actual Spark setup. So as I mentioned before, we're using uh, Amazon EMR. And you can see on the right-hand side, I have um, two clusters shown there, development and production. We actually have more than that, but we always have at least this many. Um, we keep our clusters around for um, a fairly long time, you know, like months at a time. Like we keep them around until we want to do an upgrade or uh, something like that. Um, but we do have some ad hoc clusters that we keep around just for a short time as well. But just for the purpose of the discussion, just imagine that we have multiple clusters running at the same time. We use a, uh, a tool from uh, Netflix open source called Genie, which provides a, a job server interface um, that lets us run Spark jobs. And that's what actually talks directly to uh, EMR and submits the job. And then we have um, a client that we built for Genie that we call Sheriff. And this is what actually people use to actually submit their jobs. And if it's a scheduled ETL job, um, it usually runs in an execution service that we've built um, in-house called Flotilla. Um, that's based on Amazon's uh, ECS, Elastic Container Service. So just to go over the flow of that, um, if, if a job is running, um, the job is submitted through Sheriff, and with that they would send up, for example, like their main um, PySpark driver file and maybe some supporting SQL files that maybe contain additional queries and things like that, and all of the Spark settings. So number of executors, you know, um, if they're increasing um, memory for the driver or the executors, all of that stuff is com comes through Sheriff. And then Genie has a, a REST interface. And so um, Sheriff essentially uses the REST API of Genie to tell it to start a job. And then what it does is it goes out to S3 and it looks for um, a version of Spark that is, um, the, the, the job is asking for. Because um, one of the nice things about this is this allows us to support multiple versions of Spark. And so we grab the version of Spark that we want and we actually set up the driver uh, on one of the Genie nodes. Uh, Genie also has a database that lets us track what clusters we have available, what applications we have available, and application in our sense means a version of Spark. And uh, Genie sets up the job, and then uh, we use um, EMR to actually run the job, which is essentially we're, we're taking advantage of, we're just using it as a, a yarn cluster. Uh, we also uh, have the Spark history server, which uh, at the moment runs in each cluster. Um, so people are using this to sort of get information on their jobs, especially when um, things don't go well. Um, there's a project I'll talk about in a minute where we're trying to centralize some of this information so that there's one place for people to go um, instead of having to look at a different history server for each cluster. Oops, I went too fast. Um, so the Genie service um, really provides a lot of benefits for us. Um, so one, um, it's kind of an, it's an execution service that isolates people from versions of Spark, um, the setup of Spark, and um, details of the EMR cluster. And this really makes it easy on us because if we want to roll out a different version of Spark, all we have to do is set up the configuration and the bundles on S3 that Genie uses and then expose that through um, essentially some tags that they can call. And then they could submit their job and start using that version of Spark right away. 
Uh, it also isolates um, people from um, cases where we want to either build a new cluster or rebuild a cluster or do an upgrade. So we can essentially do this all behind the scenes through tags in Genie. And when we um, tag a new cluster as being the production cluster, it'll start submitting jobs to that new cluster. And then we can shut the old one down. So it kind of isolates that, th those details a little bit and makes um, the execution a little smoother. So uh, as I was mentioning when I talked about our Spark setup, we, have, um, we usually have um, two or three permanent clusters that are around all the time. At a minimum, we always have a, a development cluster and a production cluster. Um, but we pretty often have several ad hoc clusters also going at the same time. And as I said before, we don't, um, even though we keep our clusters around for a long time, it's mainly because they're heavily used. Uh, we're running like you know, usually a thousand or more jobs a day. Um, so they're constantly busy and there's, there's not really a reason to sort of take them down unless we want to do an upgrade. And that's where Genie comes in to help us do that. Um, so we don't keep any data permanently uh, in HDFS uh, because of that. So we also have a setup, um, again, it's through our execution service called Flotilla, um, where we allow people to run um, Jupyter IPython notebooks and run uh, Py PySpark sessions uh, in an inter interactive way. And these are actually um, connected to, through, um, through the service to our uh, development cluster. Um, this is the only path uh, at the moment that we have where people run Spark jobs and it doesn't go through Genie. Pretty much everything else um, uh, that people do um, goes through the Genie service. Uh, under the hood, um, we take advantage of Amazon's uh, EMR file system. Uh, essentially, this is just a, an implementation of a Hadoop file system that allows more interac uh, efficient interaction with um, S3 under the hood. So I mentioned that we uh, support multiple versions of, of Spark. Um, so at the moment, we have um, the, the latest three uh, minor versions of Spark um, you know, supported, um, you know, soon to be 2.2 when that um, comes out um, pretty shortly. Uh, what we've been doing in order to um, get these builds of Spark out there is um, we, we actually maintain our own fork of Spark, um, not so much because we're making a lot of changes to it, but because, number one, we want to be able to apply uh, critical patches when they come out, uh, and number two, uh, build it for, you know, make sure it's built correctly for our, our versions of Hadoop, uh, our version of Yarn, um, and, uh, and, for, and for our environment, and for the versions of Scala that we want to run. So uh, another thing that we do is uh, we do snapshot builds um, from this fork uh, for testing. And again, we expose those through Genie, but um, we essentially just use that on our team for making sure that everything is okay before we roll it out as the updated version of Spark that we actually want people to use. And another way that we take advantage of Genie is um, it has a pretty fl flexible setup with um, different commands and applications. So essentially a command is Spark submit and an application is a particular version of Spark. But let's say I wanted to um, take the same version of Spark, let's say 2.1, and try a different set of default settings. So what I could do is actually create um, another command that has this set of settings and maybe some additional debug logging and use this to sort of test out the new settings to see if they, uh, they work better for our use case. And then we can switch over and make that uh, permanent when we want to make that uh, a permanent change. Okay, so this is just talking about um, some additional things that uh, we send along uh, or that we use, like in addition to Spark itself and all of our Spark jobs. So we have a Scala library that we've written um, that we just call SFS3. This is actually what every Spark job uses when it um, writes data back to S3. And what this allows us to do is uh, it implements the, the batch ID paradigm that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it also uh, does some uh, data validation. So for example, we can compare the schema of their final data frame that they're trying to write out to what we have in the Hive Metastore and warn them if something um, looks incorrect or uh, if it's a fatal error and we know that we don't want to even write the data, we can terminate the job with an error uh, if we need to. And so that's really helped, uh, helped us resolve a lot of uh, data problems by, uh, by having the ability to do that. And under the hood, uh, it again uses the uh, Amazon EMR file system um, for the, the writing uh, and committing to S3. We also have along with that um, several Hive-based utilities. Um, this is more just like APIs for, to allow them to um, create new tables if they're writing out to a brand new table or add a new partition to an existing table. Uh, we also have, um, we also set things up so that we can um, compute statistics on a newly written table so that the uh, Hive statistics are always up to date after a, a new write. And this allows things like uh, broadcast joins and some other features that we take advantage of to uh, work much better. 
Uh, so recently we've come out with, um, this is kind of a new project that's still ongoing, um, which we call Tracer. Uh, it's essentially a uh, simplified um, time series database that lets us track uh, the state of inventory at any point in time. And a lot of people are using this for different types of experiments because they want to look back in time and say, well, what did the inventory look like when a stylist was working on this fix for this customer and um, could we have picked something better? And so having like a snapshot of the state of inventory, inventory at these different points of time uh, is really important to support that. So what this is, is it's really a library that provides a uh, interface to this time series database and allows people to use that uh, inside their own Spark jobs and take advantage of the, the data that's already there. So also kind of uh, in the spirit of um, tools like Dr. Elephant, uh, we wrote a uh, Python script um, to do um, root cause diagnosis of failures that we run ourselves like at the end of um, Spark jobs. And mainly the reason we did this is because uh, we have a lot of errors that sort of happen pretty frequently in our situation. And again, it's, a lot of it is because we're pretty SQL heavy and pretty data frame error heavy that um, a lot of these errors kind of keep coming up um, again and again. And so what this does is when the job fails, it actually looks through the, uh, the log files um, of the job and tries to figure out what the, the root cause is. Uh, it also like, looks at some settings and tries to suggest other things. So if, if um, let's say the job fails because the serialization buffer wasn't big enough, we actually like, tell them what setting they need to change so that they can go and change that uh, in their job and submit it again. Um, so that's also helped, uh, again, it's, it's in the interest of being self-service and giving people the tools to sort of figure out um, you know, where their job is going wrong um, and how they can fix it themselves and kind of be a little more self-sufficient. You know, again, we'll still have to help them out for some of the extreme cases, but um, you know, they don't need to come to us if they just want to figure out that their job needs more memory. Right? They can at least uh, you know, take care of that part themselves. So first, uh, and then finally, I uh, just want to finish off with uh, some of the challenges that we faced uh, in, you know, in rolling all of this out and getting people to use Spark. And then I'll talk a little bit about some ongoing projects and ongoing work that we have. So I don't think that our challenges are necessarily uh, unique to us. Um, they're challenges that um, other people um, face um, when running Spark. Uh, and again, we ran into these a lot just because of, you know, I think, how we use Spark and things like that. Um, so one of the challenges, of course, is, uh, is education. Um, we have a lot of people who are used to SQL, and they, they um, for example, take a query that runs on Redshift. It's a big monolithic query, and they just try and port it over to Spark. And sometimes it works well, but a lot of times it doesn't, right? And um, so there's a little bit of education curve to sort of tell people that Spark has much more than just SQL, and there's other things you can take advantage of. And we've got several, um, success stories where people have, you know, we've either worked with them or they've done it on their own and they've rewritten their job to use a combination of SQL and the APIs and they've gotten, you know, factor of 10 speed ups and things like that. Um, so a lot of that was um, kind of, a lot of it is a combination of how Spark works but also educating people on how to um, use it in the best way. Um, and then of course, um, along with that, educating people on um, the things that, the most common things that can go wrong and giving them people like a starting point on um, settings to use. So um, now, now what, we, what we have done to sort of make things easier is we've um, got a pretty good set of defaults that work well for us for most of our jobs. You know, and again, it's because we're SQL heavy and data frame heavy, there's some things, some settings we've made that um, seem to work well for, for most of our jobs. Um, and you know, you can, if you um, read around, read about people's experience with Spark, I mean, they've run into some of these things too. So, you know, it's things like turning on broadcast joins and sort of coming up with the right threshold for that. Um, some of the network timeouts and the broadcast timeouts are too slow in practice and sort of need to be increased. And things like uh, result size and, you know, cryo buffer sizes, like we've had to bump those up. And so we don't run into those errors like as, as often as we, we used to, like once we got that nice baseline of defaults. Um, so with that baseline of defaults, then if somebody needs something special for their job, like through our sheriff tool, they're always able to, um, uh, you know, set their own settings to make their own job one run better. So if they want to turn off broadcast joins, they can do that. If they want to um, increase the uh, max result size, they can still do that. So essentially they have the full functionality of the um, Spark submit command line uh, through, our, through our tool. And of course, uh, along the way, um, this is mostly in um, earlier versions of Spark, we ran into a few challenging errors related to code generation and joins and things like that. And that's kind of where having our own fork and being able to apply patches quickly um, really helped. 
and also being able to upgrade and try new versions of Spark and see if that fixed problems that people were running into in their jobs. Um, that really helped us a lot in sort of getting over those. Uh, we ran just a few issues here and there with things like uh, you know, problems with the Metastore and stuff like that. Um, and probably our biggest problem, uh, again, just because uh, you know, our problem is not data size, it's more number of jobs and, and you know, diff different people doing things at the same time. Uh, we have a lot of issues with uh, scheduling and contention in the cluster, right? And these are situations where people can submit a, a large number of uh, heavy jobs that consume the cluster and prevent uh, other jobs from, from going through. And that's something we're still working through uh, and, and I think we have some solutions which I'll talk about in a second uh, related to that. So that's kind of been one of our uh, ongoing challenges. And then a little bit about um, some of the projects and things that we're still working on. Um, so related to what I just talked about, um, we're kind of reviewing um, you know, various settings related to uh, yarn queues and yarn jobs. And what we want to do is like, we have a lot of uh, critical time sensitive jobs that always need to sort of get through and we want to be able to have a high priority queue uh, in yarn so that those uh, won't be blocked by other jobs in the cluster. Uh, and that way we don't need to you know, totally over provision our cluster, but we can still make sure that those high priority jobs give through get through. Um, and also we probably will have um, start implementing some type of quota system um, based on, on users uh, or maybe teams, um, which is probably a better way to do that in, in our case. Um, the other thing that we're uh, still working on and we're almost ready to, to roll this out is a, uh, a centralized uh, Spark history server. And there's a couple reasons for, for doing this. Um, one, it, it gives people one place to, to go um, to look at the history of their job and they don't have to worry about, well, do, am I supposed to go to the prod cluster? Am I supposed to go to the dev cluster? You know, I'm not really sure where to go. Um, so there's always one permanent place where they can go. Uh, the other thing is like, because we're um, always taking clusters down and rebuilding them and, and you know, upgrading uh, the version of EMR and things like that, uh, we don't want people's job history to go away. So we wanna have a uh, central place to, uh, to keep that. So what we're doing is essentially having a, uh, a small cluster that essentially just lets us run the history server. And we're uh, basically doing, um, it's, it's effectively um, Hadoop DCP jobs to sort of copy the, the logs over to this one place. And then we'll keep those around for 20 or 30 days uh, and then um, you know, wipe them out uh, at the end. Um, but again, it's mainly just to have, have it so that people have the convenience of one place to go. And if we tear down a cluster, they can still go look at the history of their job. Uh, another thing that we're working on is uh, a data reader writer project. And I didn't have this on my uh, diagram, but there's, uh, there are some other tools that actually access uh, um, S3 directly and pull data down from S3 directly. And uh, we wanna change that and have like a, a service that's in front of that. And there's a couple reasons for doing that. Uh, one is security, but also is so that we can isolate people from the data formats that we use. So if we wanna start um, storing things in Avro or Parquet and someone wants uh, a CSV file, we can store the data the way that we think is efficient in the data warehouse and give it to them in the format that they need. And uh, it also like helps us avoid, um, you know, it helps make, make the output that we get more, more standard and lets us work easily with a lot of different tools. And so a common use case for that is just like pulling a table into to pandas or something like that. Uh, we're also, like I mentioned, different for file formats like um, Avro and Parquet. So we're, we, we, do, um, we do some Parquet stuff at the moment. Um, we have a lot of st sort of plain CSV files as well. So we wanna take more advantage of that. Uh, we're also um, experimenting with Avro a little bit, mostly in our logging pipeline, which I, I mentioned earlier, we're sort of switching to a new logging pipeline based on Kafka that's going on. And so along with that, uh, we wanna have some uh, better uh, integration with uh, the logging system. And that kind of works both ways. Like that, that means using uh, logging data within Spark Jobs itself, but also being able to take advantage of the new logging framework and log more things from Genie, log more things from Spark and have um, a central place uh, in our Elasticsearch cluster to, uh, to look for things like that. So uh, that's something that'll make our job easier, but it'll also make the uh, data scientist's job easier. And then finally, uh, you know, once we have, uh, I think, the logging pipeline in better shape, you know, that's when we wanna start looking at um, use, taking advantage of structured streaming and Spark streaming a little bit more. Um, so there's a couple use cases of that that, that keep coming up. Um, one is related to the tracer library that I mentioned earlier, that's the inventory database. You know, we wanna be able to keep that up to date as the inventory is changing over time because uh, you know, once, once a stylist picks something out for a customer, that, that inventory is effectively committed to that customer and we'd like to know about that right away. And this is gonna help enable uh, a lot of capabilities for us. 
And then another variation of that is uh, clients on the client side. So we'd like to know um, when clients are signing up, know when they've completed their style profile, and, and if we can get that information like in a more up-to-date manner, we'll know exactly like where each customer is at, you know, does a customer have a CX es escalation, things like that, and we can take advantage of that um, in a more rapid way. Because um, right now, one of the problems we have is that if a customer signs up, uh, we have to wait until uh, a batch pipeline completes until we can um, style that new customer. But with this integration, we'd be able to do that um, almost right away. And again, reduce the cycle time between the time someone signs up and when they receive their, their first shipment. And that's, that's something that the, that's important to the customers, so it's something that we're really uh, sensitive to. Well, I think this is, this is about it. Um, for me, I think I've covered everything that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions now or afterwards um, if you guys ha have any questions about anything I've talked about so far today. Right, we're opening up to the question. Um, could you speak to your experience with data scientists creating their own pipelines and kind of what are the common frustrations or challenges in that? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely like um, a, a big part of the job. Um, well, the, the, um, the good news is for us is like, I, I think our, our data scientists are pretty diverse in terms of their backgrounds. So some of them are actually more technical and have more programming experience and I think, um, and they also are willing to help each other out. And I think that sort of makes our job a little bit easier. Um, so some people are pretty much self-sufficient from day one. Um, but then there's other people that need a little bit more hand-holding. And, and usually, like, the main thing we run into is what I was talking about with the queries, is they sort of try and take a query that runs well in Redshift and then just slam it into Spark, and that doesn't always work well. So that's usually where we have to get involved and do a little more education with them and maybe help them restructure their job in a little better way. Any other questions? You mentioned that you have about 80 data scientists. Are there any software developers as well? Like, what's your ratio there? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so um, the, the, the 80 figure is really kind of a total team size. So that includes the data scientists, uh, data platform, which is my team. Um, the, the data scientists do have some people that are more um, developers, like they're doing a lot of things like with uh, creating the dashboards and stuff like that. Um, so, so again, like a, as a whole, like the team like has um, quite a bit of programming ex experience al already. Um, they don't necessarily know like I the infrastructure or the things I've talked about today, but they're able to do things like make their own dashboards and um, uh, you, you know, start writing their own pipelines. Um, so referring to the earlier overall architecture diagram, it seemed like you had three entry points for people wanting to make queries, Spark SQL, uh, Presto, and then Redshift. So could you kind of distinguish those use cases or data types that go into all those three categories? Yeah, okay, yeah, good, good question. Um, so before we started using Spark, it was pretty much just, uh, you know, Redshift. That's kind of what we started with. And then... Um, we started expanding the Spark and then adding Presto afterwards. And kind of the way we've landed now is that um, most of the larger workloads um, and larger ETLs um, are, are going through Spark. Uh, and also cases, you know, again, it's like t t telling people that Spark is more than just SQL, right? And so um, we do have a lot of jobs that um, can't be done with a query, and so Spark is really like the way to go. Um, and since we've gotten a lot of the big workloads onto Spark and off of Redshift and Presto, then both Redshift and Presto become more useful for just ad hoc small queries during the day, um, and they don't have to worry about, um, you know, let's say interference with large jobs in the, in the Spark cluster. So, so mainly the answer is like Presto and Redshift are more for kind of the interactive queries, and uh, the other thing I didn't mention is that we have some people outside of our department that want to access data in the warehouse, and that also goes through uh, Redshift. Did you uh, experiment with the EMR Steps API before you uh, proceeded on to Genie, or did you just went straight to Genie? Um, so when I started there, um, they, had already, um, they had already moved on to Genie, so that decision was made before I started uh, working with the company. Um, you know, I, I think um, today, like, I think there's, there's other things that are similar to Genie that, that are out there that maybe, like, like if we were starting from scratch today, there, there, I think there'd be some other alternatives. I, I don't know if there were as many alternatives then, um, and it seemed like the best alternative for the way that we do things. Are there any other questions? 
All right. I got a, one quick question. Can you comment on the capacity of this system design and the implementation? How many concurrent users you can support? How many of the concurrent uh, jobs you can support? Yeah, well, that, that's the good thing about Amazon is that it's, it's easy to scale. Um, so like uh, Genie is in a, um, an auto scaling group, so we can always add more instances if we're running a lot of jobs and we're running into memory problems, and that has happened before where we've had to scale up over time. And same thing for the EMR clusters. I mean, so um, we've had to keep adding more clusters and increase the size because our Spark workload has, has increased over time. But who, who is actually being responsible for that, adding more nodes, adding more Spark clusters? Yeah, that's, that's kind of what my team does. So we kind of keep an eye on, on the job load and sort of make a decision when we need to do that. And we're also working on some uh, auto-scaling scripts for, for EMR also. And that, that's actually a new, like the, the, the latest version of EMR like has that um, capability built in too. Okay, great, thanks. Great presentation, I appreciate it. Oh, we, have a, we have another question, just a second, please. Uh, so when you mentioned that your, da uh, your data scientist is uh, dumping their SQL queries uh, from Redshift just to the Spark SQL, so sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. So can you ex share some of the experience of, of uh, in terms of in what occasions it works well and what occasions it doesn't? Because uh, Redshift it's already like distributed in the back end, and so because we are ex experiencing a similar problem, we are using Snowflake, and uh, okay. yeah, so. Okay. Um. Well, so were you asking more like what are things that didn't work well in Spark coming directly from Redshift or just like? Like in terms of improving the performance of the queries and like in what occasions like you expect like when you're running on Spark SQL to improve your performance uh, over Redshift? Yeah, I mean usually like um, I think overall like um, Redshift is still a better um, SQL engine. But again, um, the, 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 the advantage of Spark is that we can um, we can do more things with it. So usually where we've run into trouble is when someone has a, a big redshift query with a lot of common table sum expressions, so a lot of with clauses, you know, and with, with subtables inside them. Like taking that over into Spark, those usually don't work so well, but with Spark you can, um, you know, write a table, cache it, make a temporary table. You can do a lot more. You have a lot more flexibility on, on, on things you can do, and those are the cases where we seem to see, like, um, a lot of improvement in rewriting the job and sort of, you know, taking it out of the big monolithic query. That's, that's kind of like, that's what I see most often. Got it, thanks. Any other questions? All right, so let's give a round of applause to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.